Welcome, welcome. On behalf of my colleagues at the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum, welcome. <laughs> my name is Megan Jones. I'm Associate Professor of Art History here at Alfred University in Southwestern New York State. As attendees join in the room, please send your greetings in the chat and tell us where you're logging in from. This event is one of a series of online events held in conjunction with the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum exhibition, Path of the Tea Bowl, a project that considers the definitions and historical contexts of the over 1000 year history of the tea bowl idiom. All of the online event recordings are or will be posted on the museum's YouTube channel. In a moment, we'll see a demonstration of tea preparation followed by ample time for your questions. Please keep your microphone on mute during the demonstration and write your questions in the chat. After the demonstration, please continue to post questions in the chat, raise your hand, or just jump in to ask a question. Our presenter is Omar Francis, a licensed instructor in the Urasenke tradition of Chado, commonly known as the Japanese tea ceremony. He was first introduced to Chado at the University of Illinois in 1992 and was later admitted into the Midorikai program for a year of intensive training at the Urasenke headquarters in Kyoto, Japan. Since then, he has continued his studies as a member of the Chicago Association of Urasenke, taking part in many educational and cultural activities. He's currently teaching at the Japanese Culture Center in Chicago, Illinois. Over to you, Francis Sensei. Hello. Here we go. I just have to make sure I'm unmuted. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me tonight. Um, we're going to have plenty of time. I'm going to talk a little bit about tea. I'm going to show a little bit about tea, and hopefully it'll go along perfectly with your exhibition. Um, we're going to focus a little bit more on the tea bowl tonight, but please, if you have any questions, just jump right in and we'll, we'll figure it out. So, Japanese tea ceremony. Um, boy, we could talk about that all night. So I'll just kind of give you some of the highlights. So from the Japanese point of view, tea pretty much came from China. It, of course, maybe it came from someplace else before that, but from a Japanese point of view, it came from China probably more officially with Buddhism in like the sixth century. Buddhism actually was introduced to Japan from Korea as they were looking to get favor from the imperial court and helping them out with some wars. Um, so that was the official entrance of Buddhism and also tea at that same time. But it wasn't matcha. It wasn't what we're gonna be talking about tonight. It was more of a steep tea, most likely like a, a compressed um, brick tea that you would break some of it off, add not sugar, but maybe more things like um, ginger and onions and stuff like that. So you have a savory chai. So as you can imagine, it didn't exactly catch on in Japan, but it was there and some people would have it, but really it was more something in the temples or in the courts. Uh, if you jump ahead, like another really 600 years, um, in the 12th century, Zen Buddhism started to come into Japan. Now, as I just mentioned, Buddhism came in earlier, but it wasn't Zen Buddhism. There's another type of Buddhism, several different types of Buddhism actually, but Zen was something new in the 12th century. And it had a radical new way of being practice and it had a new way of drinking tea. Because at that time, it, there was no real matcha in Japan. And so when you have matcha, it's a green powder tea and the tea's put into a bowl, which you'll see soon, and you whip that up in the bowl. So that's of course why we need bowls for tea because it's not made um, in a pot and then you pour out portions, it's made one at a time in a bowl. Now, even jumping ahead more, it wasn't really until the 16th century or towards the end of the 16th century where what we call Chama Yu came into existence, into existence. So true, tea did kind of come from China and some of the practices of tea came from China, but what we call the tea ceremony or what some people call the tea ceremony, really didn't come into existence until it became Japanese. And so it is fair to call it a Japanese invention, though it clearly have roots in, from other places. Um, but there's so much I could say, 
But I think I want to focus just a little bit on the tea bowls first, and then we'll get a little bit more into the philosophy and the ideas behind it. So please, if you got questions, start generating them, but we'll get to those real soon. So to really talk about the T-Bowls a little bit, I'm going to have to switch my camera. So if I don't mess that up, that should be really smooth. Let's see. OK, and I'm going to fix that. That looks a little strange. There we go. <laughs> That's better. OK, so this is my desk right here in front of me. So T-Bowls, there's so many. <laughs> Here's one that I have here. And sorry, I'll just switch that a little bit. So we care a lot about tea bowls, but we care a lot about all the utensils in tea. So it's not that the bowl itself is necessarily always the focus of the tea gathering. You have to balance it with so many other things. Let me get that out of the way. So this one particular bowl, it's a little bowl. It's a little fun. It's a little decorative. Um, I'll try to get that a little closer if you can see. And you know what? I'm going to switch cameras just so you can see that a hair a bit better. And then I'll switch right back. There we go. All right. So this bow here, you can see there's a design here in the front. It's, um, there's an official on a horse and then a few follow him. And then there's like a design on the inside. And I, I thought I'd bring this up because T-Bowls clearly have a front and back. You know, this is the backside and you wouldn't see much of it. And in fact, when the person is making tea, it's facing the person preparing the bowl. And the guest may not actually see the design until it comes right in front of them. This particular design, it carries over on the inside of the bowl. So you have the close trees and then you have the distant mountains and the tree kind of carries over a little bit there to the side. Here, and I'm going to switch back again and change that crazy filter. There we go. Okay. So what I've learned, though, is that tea bowls themselves don't necessarily just have their own personality. As in, like, it just doesn't always, it's not always one thing. And it will change depending on what you have with it. So I brought a couple of tea containers with me just to kind of show what I mean. So. Here's our more basic black tea container. And so if let's say the bowl itself really is going to be the focus of your tea gathering, you want other things that will kind of move into the background so the tea bowl can come forward. So maybe this one would work. Actually, maybe this one will work a little better. And as you can see, it, it kind of changes the theme a little bit or the feel or the vibe of the gathering. So it could be something bold and festive, it could be something somber. Or you could really get a little crazy. And I have this glass or crystal tea container. Now it's empty right now, but you can imagine if there was tea inside, you can see it through the container itself. And maybe these two would work together. But honestly, usually for my taste, this might be a little too much. It's kind of a one or the other. So maybe I would do something a little bit more like this where there's a little bit of design here. In fact, what we got here is a couple pulling a rope. And then you wouldn't know it until later on that you take a close inspection, that inside there's a little boat that they're pulling down a river. And maybe these two work together. So you have the theme of a couple on an outing. These are probably more peasants. And at the same time, the aristocrats are out and join the scene. So it's not that, again, the bowl is just one thing. It, you can kind of create a theme in your gathering. Um, and to show a little bit more, sorry, of contrast, I do have another bowl. And I will talk a little bit more about those bowls in a second. So as you already can see, when you have a tea bowl, you often have a box inside a box inside of a box inside of a box. So here's my first box. We'll get deep into this here in a second. Here's the second box. I have it turned sideways so you can see it a little better. Usually this will be facing. Sorry, this takes a moment. Gotta be careful. I'll just put that to the side for now. 
Okay, so this is a very different bowl. This is a black Raku Chawan, and this particular one has a nice sheen to it, so it's very shiny. So if I compare these two side by side, they have quite a different feel to them. Still tea bowls, of course, and still a bowl for matcha. This bowl here, even though it's very decorative, it has all this gold highlighting and all this enamel work and stuff, this is for thin tea for usucha. It's the more informal tea, the more casual tea, the type of tea that actually most of us are most familiar with. It's green, it's frothy on the top, um, has a delicious foam, and you just, you can't help but to drink it down. That's actually what I'll be making in a little bit. But there's another type of tea, still matcha that we have called koicha. Koicha tends to be a far more thick, and there's no foam to it. It's almost like melted ice cream, uh, watery smoothie, it's thick. It's so thick that if you have it on an empty stomach, you might feel a little queasy. So that's why we have a whole meal before we have koi cha. And so that our stomach is settled and everything's fine and then we can enjoy the thick tea. So the thick tea then is more, or the bowls that we use for thick tea are more somber. So you can use this bowl for thick tea. You can never use this bowl for thick tea because it's just too festive. Let's say if you're going to go to a dinner party and you can be in your tuxedo and, you know, tie and uh, all dressed up nicely, or you can show up in a rhinestone jacket with flashing lights. That might not really work for the dinner party, even though it might be more expensive, even though it might be more skilled to make it. It's just not the right thing. So the reason I brought these two out, though, is that, again, with the same this out of the way with the same different tea containers you do get a different feel feeling from it so you have the black and red or you might decide to just go black and black maybe not always recommend it but you, you don't want the utensils to match necessarily you want them to complement each other so maybe a black tea container and a black tea bowl might be too much but this could be interesting let me get that a little closer together. Okay, so they might seem like they're competing, but they're so different from each other that you still can see both of them. So you have something shiny and glittering. You have something more deep and somber, and maybe this will make the black seem blacker, and this will seem the white seem whiter. I don't know. <laughs> and then there's still, of course, one of my favorite. Um, this particular tea container it is lacquered, but it has um, paper on top of it and then lacquer on top of that. So it has a more natural feeling. And I don't know if it all shows up on the camera, but there's a lot of texture to it. And so maybe together they create something interesting. But I would be in trouble if I don't mention, of course, the typical container that does go with the koi cha is a different vessel altogether. There we go. Sorry for all the show and tell, but this is a chaire. Oh, there's one inside there. I'll open it in just a second. So usually for thick tea, instead of a small lacquer container or a glass container or any variation like that, we tend to use something a little more stately. So when the guests come into the room, they might see this already waiting for them. Sometimes it's maybe in the bowl like that. And so that gives a different impression than let's say, <laughs> sorry, I, I hum to myself a lot. There we go. <laughs> so that, uh, now by no means am I saying like this is wrong and this is right or this is better than that. It's just that there's different times for them. So in a longer full tea gathering, which could last three and a half hours, you could have the koi cha made with this vessel first. And it kind of builds up to the highlight of having the koi cha. And then later you would have the usu cha, which is lighter and the feeling is a little more relaxed and like just after going through something special. But I'm not gonna tease you and just keep this wrapped up. Let me open this up here. Oh, I should do it properly. There we go. <laughs> so this 
So this is a ceramic container. I'll turn it more so the front is facing you. So when I say front and back, of course, there's usually some kind of design that distinguish the front. This is true for tea bowls. This is true for tea containers. Anything you have in the tea room has a front and back. And so we use these things with the front facing us. And then when we're done and let's say presenting to the guests, we turn them around. But this is a ceramic container. It's Tamba Yaki, Tamba ware from Japan. And it would have an ivory lid. This is not real ivory, so don't worry. It's something imitation. So typically then for koi cha, you have things that are more subtle and subdued. And for usucha, you have things more light. But show you one more thing. I know I'm getting quite the collection here. Let me let me clear this out for one second before we get a little bit further. Okay. So I have this tea bowl. And I have to admit, when I first got it, I didn't really like it so much. But maybe the color of the light doesn't show it super well, but it's it's kind of pink. And I don't know, I just wasn't feeling pink so much myself. But, you know, my wife found it for me at a thrift shop, and I would be a fool to say that I didn't want it. And I looked at it, and I lived with it. And over time, I started to like it more and more. And if you see, there's all sorts of things going on here. What I think it is, it's a low-fired clay, um, sorry, probably an earthenware. Um, it's not from Japan, but it's made by someone who clearly knows tea bowls and it was made in 79. So I couldn't really say what type of ceramic is, but they have a crackle glaze in it. There's a little swoop going on the inside. And I think on the outside, they probably, they probably use different glazes. Let's say maybe use high fire glaze, fired low. And so it's kind of not quite clear here. It's kind of muddy and it has all these little pop marks on it. So at first I was like, hmm, but then as time went on, I started to like it more and more. And I think I started to like it more and more when I started to use it with darker utensils. So when I started to use it, let's say with this Natsume or, or even, let's see here, in a darker space, you know, sometimes these really bold designs were never really meant to be seen in a really bright room. Like if you think of Geisha, for instance, with all their white makeup, that was so that they stand out in the dark. So some of these utensils were really made to be seen in a dark tea room. So I found for myself, the more I started to use this um, with maybe a darker background, with other subdued things, so the tea bowl itself can kind of pop out, that I started to enjoy this more and more. And, you know, I started to enjoy like the sky-like pattern, or I started to think of like, I don't know, stars and galaxies and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's just nice to not get rid of things. Maybe hang on to it for a little bit. Maybe play with it a little bit and let it grow on you. Um, of course, if you don't like something, <laughs> you're always welcome not to like it. But I will make you tea with this bowl tonight. And I'll just put these other guys to the side. And again, I haven't talked a whole lot about tea philosophy, but we will get there. So let me just move a couple of things out of the way. And I won't explain a whole lot while I'm making the tea initially. Um, so I think I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it first. That way it kind of makes sense as I'm doing it. So I'm gonna switch my camera and change my filter a little bit. Hi. <laughs> so I know I'm talking a lot about utensils and I just kind of want to get into that a little bit because I know there's a lot of ceramic artists here. Um, the utensils that we use in tea are very, very important. In fact, so much of what Chama Yu is, is using objects. Sometimes maybe you're the maker of the objects, but more so than not, you're the collector of objects. Um, tea bowls and scrolls and um, even the tea room architecture and all these different things you bring together. And even though you might not be the one who created them, it shows the tea person's point of view when you put them together. So your art as a tea person may be more so how you arrange these things. As I mentioned before, um, the term toriawase comes up. How you put things together shows the host point of view. 
that's the art of the host is how you arrange things together. Um, it could be a theme, there could be all sorts of reasons to use these utensils. And so again, the tables themselves don't have just one face. You create the face and how you put it together. Um, the scroll even, the scroll you might have may also set the theme of the gathering. And I will explain that in a moment. Um, the guests you have, the food you serve, all these things together creates this moment in time that you're trying to share with someone else. Um, so we use the utensils to kind of create a moment. There are, of course, some times where the utensils are so wonderful that it kind of dictates how the entire gathering is going to go. But for the most part, we try to focus on people. And all of this is so that we have something interesting enough that we can stay focused on this one moment together. So in Channel U, still get my things together here, we have four principles of tea. Harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. So it's the harmony between the host and the guest, but also as we were saying between the utensils and how they work together. It doesn't mean that you want everything to make the same note. Sometimes you want a little bit here, a little bit there, and something comes together that's unique in that moment. Respect will show up because each thing is handled in a different way. The tea bowl, the tea scoop, the tea container, they're all handled in their own unique and very specific way. And so you show respect to things, you show respect to people, and then hopefully slowly you'll learn to respect things outside of the tea room. It's not just about how things come together here, hopefully it bleeds out into the rest of your life. Um, purity is gonna really jump out because a lot of what you're gonna see here is me purifying and preparing things. But again, it's not a purity of, I just gotta keep things clean. It's a purity of taking care of the utensils and putting them in the right place actually helps put my mind in the right place. And so by the time I'm making tea for you, I'm doing it from a place of respect and beauty. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get the grand honor of making dinner. Sometimes I make it a lot. And sometimes instead of being like, oh, here's your dinner, please, I hope you enjoy it some kind of other attitude comes out like, oh, why do I always have to be the one? And here you go, and you better like it. Well, that's not great. No one's gonna like that. That's not gonna taste good to anyone. So the attitude that you put into something comes through in the perception, through the taste or the experience. So a lot of what we do here is to prepare ourselves to make something beautiful. But the thing that we're trying to make beautiful is not necessarily just the tea, but this moment. So again, it's harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. That's what we're trying to get to. Just this moment, just this moment to enjoy. Doesn't imply that everything's perfect. It doesn't imply that all your problems are fading away. It just means that you're here and you're enjoying this moment together. So for us, for me, it's nice to just really get into tea and that helps me do this. For other people, it could be calligraphy, it could be baseball, it could be ice skating, it could be going to hockey games. You know, in some ways it doesn't matter. You know, if you can put your heart into it and share it with people who appreciate it, I think we're gonna pretty much feel the same thing. But you gotta be true yourself and you gotta find the way that works for you. So this works for me. So if you allow me to, I'll make you a bowl of tea or okay, I'll make me a bowl of tea. <laughs> I will drink it, but I'll try to pretend it's for you. I'll just go through one of our basic ways of making tea. And again, I won't say a lot until maybe about the point where I'm drinking. But treat, please try to keep in mind, harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. So I do have to switch my camera one more time. And as you saw, I have a lot of boxes. So I'm going to move this hopefully out of the way. Okay. Yes. And if you had any more questions about those bowls, I can bring them out later and I'll show you again. But let me just switch the camera. Okay. And again, I have to switch my filter. There we go. All right. So what's hard for me sometimes is stopping all this talking, <laughs> stopping all this yapping and just make tea. So here we go. Oh. 
too much in the background. I'll try to keep that nice. So each object will be purified. I have this cloth called a fukusa. And the folding of the fukusa will purify the fukusa. So then I can purify the object itself. So again, I have to fold that again for the T-school. Hopefully you can see everything. I'm trying to do it close enough to the camera. So excuse me if I'm a little off form, but I wanna make sure you can see. There's our tea whisk and a cloth. So I have my water a little bit here off camera. So I mentioned that there's purification. The cloth I use to purify a few objects, the tea scoop and the tea container. Other objects will be purified by water. So the water is purifying the bowl, but also warming up the bowl so that it comes to a nice temperature so that when I make tea, oh, sorry, my fingers are cramping a little bit. Um, when I make tea, the bowl won't shock the um, temperature of the tea itself and it won't be subpar. Also, if you've ever had like a cold beverage in a warm glass and that feels so strange, it's equally as strange to have hot tea in a cold bowl. So it's just, it just feels right. Let me just put that a little bit here. The hot water also prepares the tea whisk, so it's more soft and subtle, supple, sorry. And so that when you're whipping tea, you won't have the risk of a tine breaking off into your bowl of tea itself. So everything is very practical, but also beautiful at the same time. And when I say beautiful, but what it should be, not necessarily everything that I'm doing right now. So let me change that down. So what would happen here is that I would ask the guests to go ahead and have their sweet. Now I'm not gonna tease you and eat a sweet in front of you, but I would pick this up. And then to my guests, I would say, Okashio dozo, or please have your sweet. And then I'll go ahead and prepare their tea. So it's really one portion, one person's amount of tea, probably want to see that, one person's amount of tea at a time in the bowl. A lot of times it's the same bowl. So I would make a bowl of tea for the first guest. It gets returned to me. I rinse it and I make another bowl of tea for the second guest in the same bowl. So at one at a time, you're drinking from the same tea bowl. However, if we were having the thick tea, the koicha, it's everyone's portion in the bowl at one time, and it's passed around the room almost like a communion of sorts. So everyone's drinking from the same bowl for koicha. As you can imagine, this has been really hard during COVID. Um, we're trying our best to be safe for everyone while still having the spirit of sharing tea. There we go. Hmm. Fair warning. When I have a bowl of tea, I tend to get really chatty. So I hope you got questions because it's gonna get weird. <laughs> Here we go. So I'm just gonna explain a little bit what would happen from the guest point of view. So I'm just gonna slide this over a little bit so I don't have the other objects in front of me. So as the host, after I finished making the bowl of tea, I would turn it around, sorry. So the front is facing away from me and then the guest will come get it. So I'll just go ahead and turn that back around. So let's pretend again that I am, let's say I'm the second guest because it just gets more interesting that way. So let's say I'm the second guest. I go get my tea 
I bring it back to myself. Now you would think, all right, good, yes, tea time. I'm gonna drink right away, but there's a few things to do first. If I'm the second guest, I would actually put the bowl between myself and the first guest and say something like, Oshoban ni itashimasu. Or there'll be a little bit of a conversation where I would say, please, I know you've had a bowl of tea, but why don't you have my tea? You look thirsty, you might want more. And they, they'll say something like, oh no, 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 that's okay. You go ahead and have tea. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, well in that case, I'll put the bowl between myself and the next guest who has not had tea yet, and I'll say, Osaki ni, so sorry for going before you. Then I'm free to put the tea in front of myself and to the host who made me tea, I will say, Otamai chodai itashimasu. Thank you, thank you very much for going through the trouble of making tea for me. Maybe it's a nice way to say it. Um, I can almost drink now. <laughs> One second. Sorry, my hands are cramping just a little bit today. There we go. So I would pick the bowl up, I would hold it in my hand, and I would raise it slightly in the air. I know the camera is not showing all of me, but ah, my office. So I would raise it slightly in the air. This is not because I am praising the bowl. This is not because I am praising the tea. It's a moment of appreciation and thankfulness for everything that came into this moment for us to have tea together. Um, someone had to grow this tea. Someone had to cultivate the land. Someone had to package the tea. Someone had to send it from Japan to here. My parents had to have met, your parents had to have met. Someone had to create this computer and technology. And if you think about it, it really goes to like all of existence up to this point in time was required for us to sit here and have this bowl of tea. So when you bow to the bowl, it's not bowing to the objects, it's bowing to the moment and showing thankfulness for this moment in time. In fact, we don't really bow to any particular object except a scroll. Everything else we just look at respectfully. So I really wanna drink this tea. So if you let me, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and again, lift the bowl up and I already turned it around and I'm gonna, Go. So after you finish your tea, you can turn the bowl bar around. And actually, while my talking, this is the front. Then you can put the bowl down in front of you. And before you give it back to the host, you actually have a moment where you can look just at the bowl as it is, and then you can pick it up. You could turn it around, you could turn it upside down, you can really examine it because everything here is for your appreciation as the guest. And the host would want you to ask questions, would want you to ex experience and appreciate it. It would be probably a little hurt if you just kind of drink your tea and left. So after you look carefully at the bowl, oops, then you could return it back to your host. And I have just a little bit more to do, but I will make it a little more swift. There we go. So never do what I just did. We don't really slide things around. We mostly pick it up, but this is a board that I made myself and it has sliders on the bottom just to make my life a little easier. So don't do as I do. Here we go. So after the tea's returned, the host would actually make more bowls of tea for each guest. In fact, the host will continue to make bowls of tea until told to stop. So a guest could have one bowl, two bowl, three bowls of usucha if they want it. Um, I wouldn't know until someone told me to please finish. So as I pour out the tea, oh, here, let me just hang on to that. I'm usually told by someone that, oh, we've had enough, please finish. I would acknowledge them and say, in that case, I will finish. So I will finish rather quickly here because I don't wanna leave this empty or half done in front of you. But it's just a matter of putting things away. But as I mentioned the scroll, which I'll show again in just a moment, it talks a little bit about that feeling that I said about being in this moment and appreciating this one moment in time and that all these things came together for us to enjoy this moment together. 
So the scroll that I have, which I'll show again in a moment, says Ichigo, Ichie, which means one moment opportunity. The feeling is that a tea gathering is a once in a lifetime event. Not because it's the most special thing in the world, it's because even if we met here every day for the rest of our lives, we won't feel like we do right now. What we see, what we feel right now is unique and special and only happens once. And so we need to put our heart completely into this moment so we can appreciate it. I like to also think too that we have to let it go because if we hang on to it forever, then we can't appreciate the next moment in time. So you have to be able to completely hang on and then completely let go. So you can just be here. And so Ichigo Ichie kind of points to that. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Let's just be here together. And um, you know, it's special. But again, I should throw out the disclaimer. It's not just that tea is special. It's not just that channel you is special. It's that everything in your life is special. Every moment, one after another, is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It helps me to do tea so I can appreciate that. But truly, every single thing you do is just as special and just as important as this. But anyway, thank you for letting me ramble for a little bit. I know I glossed over the history of tea very quickly. So if you have any questions or something didn't seem like it lined up right, please ask me and I'll, I'll try to clear that up. Thank you so much. We've already got some questions in the chat, so I'll go ahead and get started with those. Audience, please keep those questions coming either in the chat or go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. I'll get to the first two questions now. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Hope Childers posed the question, would tea ceremonies normally be chatty with guests speaking among themselves or would it all be silent reverence? Well, sometimes it's whatever you want it to be. Um, now, there are different tea gatherings. Some are decidedly more casual than others. I kind of mentioned that a full tea gathering is like three and a half hours. You're not just having tea that whole time. There's all different stages that you go through, like going through a garden, or purifying your hands and mouth, or having this like multi-course meal, tons of sake, thin tea, thick tea, you know, so it takes, you know, a bit of time. The only time that there is absolutely no talking is during the preparation of the thick tea. So when the host comes into the room and starts making thick tea, and again, I mentioned it's, it comes into, it comes out of usually a container like this, um, up to the point that the first guest is drinking, there's typically no talking. Outside of that, you could talk the whole way through. Um, but you really should keep it on what's going on. So you can talk about the flowers, you can talk about the scrolls, you can talk about the weather, but you wouldn't talk about sports. Uh, you can talk about poetry that comes to mind. Um, so it, it really is up to the host and the first guest, because even at a tea gathering, the talking is really confined to the first guest and the host. There is definitely equality in the tea room, but even with equals, there's someone who just is in charge. And so if the first guest is not very talkative, then there's not gonna be much talking. If the host likes to be very quiet, then everyone picks up on that and we just be here. So I think it's just like a dinner party or getting together with your best friends or your in-laws or a job interview. It's still dinner maybe, it's what who's there brings things out. So it could go the whole gambit. Usually for presentations, we keep very quiet because we want everyone to see what we're doing. But to tell the truth, it's like, take me and put three of me in a room. That's what a tea gathering could be. But at the same time, you know how to read the atmosphere and sometimes we're absolutely silent. And then it's over, then we move to something else. So it, it's honestly, what you make it is what a tea gathering will be. And who determines who is the first guests and can you talk a little bit about sure. how many guests usually it's by invitation like if you're doing things very formally um and if you're doing this um full tea gathering you know where it's several several hours um in that case there'll be like a handwritten invitation from the host given to particularly the first guest and i might mention who else i am thinking of inviting 
to keep them company. So in many ways, the first guest is my focus and the other people are there to create a good atmosphere. Um, it's nice not to have any more than let's say four guests if you can. So it'll be four guests and a host, um, maybe three is better then it's not too many people. Also, it gets longer and longer the more people you have. And typically we're sitting on the floor, on our knees and Seiza for the whole thing. And you wanna be kind to people <laughs> and, and give them opportunities to get up and move and not last too long. But it's usually determined by the host. The exception to that is sometimes we have these big open, like open house tea gatherings. We call those chakais instead of chajis. Chajis are the more formal tea gathering. In a chakai, it could be like several groups of people will come throughout the day. We're gonna have tea at one o'clock and we're gonna have tea at three o'clock and we're gonna have tea at five o'clock. And we have a cap of the number of people for each group, but we don't know who's gonna come. So the guests themselves kind of figure out who's gonna be the first guest. And if you've ever been lucky enough to see that, it's kind of amazing because everyone's trying not to stand out. So it'll be like, oh, Omar, why don't you go first? Oh, no, 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 I couldn't possibly go first. You, you haven't had the experience. You really should be the first guest. But, but Omar Sensei, you're so wise and, and you should lead us. Like, no, 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 really, really, I, I've had enough. And then this back and forth will go on for 10, 15 minutes, but somehow it gets figured out who should really be first. Sometimes it's the, the person most experienced in tea tends to be the person first because there's so many rules and no one's gonna tell you what to do at a tea gathering, you should know. So the most experienced or perhaps the oldest person usually ends up first, but it's not automatic because then if some people's feelings might get hurt. So there has to be this little negotiation. And again, you don't know what it's gonna be like depending who's the first guest. So it's a spontaneous, interesting gathering, and you don't know who's going to come into the door. So, mm. Just like fun. these, just like these questions coming in. We're not yes. really sure what, yeah. <laughs> but there are a lot of questions coming in now. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Bob Myers, how gendered is the tea ceremony? Ah, he asks. Well, fairly, <laughs> uh, it's changed over time. Um, like so many things in traditional Japanese culture, um, it tends to be the men who did most of it in the public eye. I think for many things, women were always doing just as much as men, but they maybe they did it at home with their friends, but the people who decidedly went out into the world and did large tea gatherings and rub elbows with the rich and powerful, when you go back to like the beginning stages of tea, that tend to be almost exclusively men. Um, things have changed over time. And when Japan closed itself off from most of the Western world, and I should say they didn't close themselves off from the entire world. We say that, but they closed themselves off from the Western world mostly, still trading with China and other places too, but still. When they mostly closed themselves off and then the world kind of changed, then they decided, oh, we better catch up. Um, doing things, Japanese kind of fell out of favor a little bit and people were really trying to modernize and so it just so happened then a lot of traditional things kind of fell onto women to do more for whatever reason. And so nowadays too, the majority of people who study tea in Japan, like 90% of the people are women in Japan. Outside of the United States, eh, maybe it's more like half and half. Um, but still, yeah, there is certain gender things because I am part of the Urasenke school. There are several different traditions of school schools and we have a grandmaster and it gets passed down usually from father to son. So typically in the tea schools, the, for lack of a better word, the grandmaster will most likely always be a man and the teachers right underneath them will probably also often be men. But outside of that, almost, almost everyone who studies tea are women in Japan. So it, it's, it's tricky, you know, it, it, it's, there's a mix there and there's some kind of dynamic going on that honestly, I don't completely understand, but it's there. But the nice thing is it is open to everyone. Japanese, not Japanese, men, women, you could wear kimono, you could not wear kimono, you can speak Japanese or not Japanese. Now, even more so than in the past, it is open to everyone. 
um, and there's no real restrictions in your gender. We don't do it differently if you're a man or a woman. The host can be a man, the host can be a woman, uh, the guest can be whatever gender, but just maybe sometimes in the structure of the schools, certain roles tend to be male or female, but anyone can do this anytime you want to. So it's a complicated answer. Um, in one way, there's no restrictions. In other ways, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's so many questions coming into the chat. I want to be sure to get to all of them. So I'm jumping around a bit to keep things thematic. Our exhibition collaborator, Dr. Natsu Oyobe from the University mm. of Michigan Museum of Art writes, it was a wonderful talk and presentation. Thank you. Can you talk about some of your most memorable tea gatherings? Oh, it's hard. <laughs> Partly because Tea is very influenced by Zen. And so maybe that's even one of the reasons why I was first attracted to um, Channel Yu, because for me personally, it was a way to put Zen ideas into physical practice. So it's not just me sitting by myself, meditating and congratulating myself on how great I'm meditating. It's like me doing something with other people, allowing yourself to be seen and critiqued by others. But still with that Zen idea in mind, I think, trying to compare things is not something that you necessarily want to do. You know, each tea gathering is wonderful. Each tea ga gathering is memorable. Um, each one taught me something differently. But since we're here, <laughs> one did come out to mind that once I was in Japan and I was studying in Japan as a student, and one of the teachers actually, went, I think it was Birch Sensei from um, England, who's unfortunately has passed away now, he was in town and the two of us decided, he's like, oh, come with me, Omar. We're gonna go to this tea gathering. One of those open-ended tea gatherings where you never who the, know who the guest was. So we got our kimonos on, we walked down the streets of Kyoto, we're being very proper. And I swear, I saw like tour buses pass by and they would lean to the side because everybody would look out the window to see, look at those guys, they're in kimono. And so sure enough, we get to the place. It was a beautiful um, tea house connected to a temple. We go there and they insisted that we become the first two guests. So Birch Sensei, who was very much more experienced than I was and ever will be, he was the first. And then I was right next to him. And then everyone was watching us the whole time to see what we would do. And I do remember that when I finally got the tea bowl, it was passed over from my, my teacher to me. I was so kind of nervous that the tea kind of dribbled down <laughs> onto my kimono. And so I was just so like, all the eyes were on me that I, I couldn't really relax. And I don't know why, but that one really stands out right now. But there's been so many other gatherings and they've all been wonderful, but um, I was not prepared for all of that attention um, that day, but it was still a lot of fun, <laughs> a lot of fun. What a great story. Uh, another question in the chat from the curator Emerita for ceramics at the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery of the Smithsonian Institution, Louise Court. Hello, Louise. Her question, uh, what are your goals and aspirations for teaching Ooh. tea in the US? Ooh. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've gone right to the the, yeah. the the complex question. So take a moment. You couldn't ask me what my favorite color was. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, honestly, I don't have any. I think my biggest goal is not to have goals at all, because sometimes when we when we decide I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, that's where disappointment sets in. That's where you judge yourself that you didn't get where you wanted to, or you've kind of already decided in some way or another what you think the world should be. And then you decide it should be this way, and this is what I'm gonna do to get there. Now, we have to work hard, I have to work hard, um, but I think I'd rather just take what comes at me. You know, like tonight, you know, we, we, it just happened. And so I'm so happy that I have this opportunity to be with people and talk about tea. Um, you know, I'm just one of like so many other people doing tea and um, there's millions of us out there. And for my school, the Urasenke school, our grandmaster and his father before him really want to, pre to spread tea around the world, you know, and have an idea of like peacefulness through a bowl of tea. And I think that's so wonderful and that's so great for them to have these giant 
big lofty ideas. Um, I don't think I need to put anything more to that. You know, that goal's big enough for all of us. So if I could be helpful in that, that's great. If I could be useful in that, that's great. But I think the best thing for me is just keep making tea and see what happens. Um, yeah, if I had too many goals, then I open myself up for too many disappointments. So no goals, I'm fine. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that response. Uh, a question from Rory Allen about Buddhist meditation. Mm, yes. The concepts please. of harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility all aim to not only bring members into the moment, but to also spread into the members' outside lives. Mm. Do those find their roots in Buddhist meditation? Wow, that's a tricky one, too. Um, <laughs> For sure, Zen Buddhism has been one of the biggest influences on the Japanese tea ceremony. We also call it Chanoyu or Chado. Um, and so it, we can't help that those certain ideas behind Zen, it's also in tea. But I, I should really say too, though, it's not a substitute for meditation. You know, meditation is meditation. If you need to meditate, which we probably all do, you meditate. So tea is not a substitution, but it's something that the ideas or that kind of peacefulness or that kind of mindset that you get from meditation, you get to kind of not just have it just in your heart, but to kind of share with others. Um, I think, yes. Oof. <laughs> I think it's hard because I don't want to speak for the whole world. I guess that's what I'm trying to say too. So I, I do think that, <clears throat> I guess I just keep going back to the idea that many times with Zen Buddhism, and I think I've been very influenced by certain ideas in it, is that it's not about certain goals. You know, so it's not that we do tea to make people feel this way, or you meditate so you get enlightened. You meditate because that's what you do. If you become enlightened, we'll see. Um, why do you need to be enlightened so much? What are you trying to get out of it? Why aren't you satisfied with yourself? Why do you think you understand the world? Oh, that's interesting. So I don't know if the goal of Zen is to do anything. And maybe the best goal to have is not to have goals. That idea of all that pressure that's floating around, if you can just leave that behind and then figure out what's our motivations when we're not so greedy. Because I think we're still going to do things and we're still motivated to live in the world. But if it doesn't come from just my own singular idea, singular ideas, then where does it come from? And isn't that amazing? So I know there's connections between T and Zen, but unfortunately I can't name them. <laughs> I can't name the goals, but they're there. And I, I think it has been said that T and Zen have the same taste. So the motivations behind Zen are right there with T, but they're also in calligraphy. They're also in dance. There's also in Kibuki. So we're not the exclusive, exclusive holders of these ideas. <laughs> Thank you. These responses from you have been really inspiring. I'd like to invite uh, those of you who've, who've posed questions in the chat. If you wish, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your question live. There was a question from Hal Higginbotham, Ben Howard, hmm. Michael Shimbashi. Uh, jump yeah, in if you wish. I'll try to have a good answer. <laughs> uh, so this is Alec and Bottom. Thank okay. you for your talk. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, always nice to see somebody with King T. Um, Thank you. Hope, I hope it was as rewarding for you as it was for us to watch it. Um, so my question really went to the distinction you were drawing earlier about uh, the appropriateness of mm. some bowls for thick tea and other bowls for sure, thin tea. And sure. I wonder if you could just speak a little bit more about what in your mind uh, in evaluating the bowls uh, categorically, if you will, uh, sets up that distinction? Well, a lot of times, um, again, I, I know things mostly from my own school's perspective. And so Urasenke school, um, along with other ones, kind of consider themselves wabi cha or wabi tea. So the idea that we lean more towards um, the sense of wabi, of kind of showing nature, of showing the hand of the artist, of letting things be natural. Um, 
but natural, including human beings, because we're natural too. So it's not like it's nature and people. It's like we're part of nature. So when it comes to tea bowls, um, particularly for thick tea, we like that kind of natural feeling. So if it's going to have decorations, they shouldn't be so, let me get my bowls out. It shouldn't be something so distinctive as this, you know, as, sorry, my lights are so bright. So that's a little too figurative, too exacting, that if it's for koi cha, if it's for thick tea, it should be something far more somber. And if you do have like a decoration, it's something that's naturally made in the kiln. So let's say you do wood, by, wood firing for your ceramics and you get like a layer of ash on it. That will still be okay for koi cha because it's a natural decoration or even if you, let's say, take a little rope and wrap it around the ceramic piece before you fire it and that rope disintegrates, but it kind of puts flashes of color on it, that's usually okay for koi cha. It's usually something in general on the darker side, but on the natural side, um, browns, grays, things like that, things that aren't so flashy, but might be kind of deep to them. We're not trying to use, let's say, porcelains and you know blue and white designs and something like that. For us, that tends to be okay for thin tea, but it's too flashy for thick tea. Also, on a practical side, Raku tea bowls like this one, they're a low fire, um, they're um, earthenware. And so they're very insulating for the hot, hot koi cha that we have. And so you're gonna hold it in your hand for a long time and it gets passed around. So this holds the heat very well and protects your hand. Whereas something like this, the heat would just go right through and you're like, <laughs> as you're kind of passing the bowl around. So a lot of times for koi cha, it's something that's a little thicker, something a little more handmade, something that will insulate and feel good in your hands, as opposed to something really stern and um, precise. Um, this is a great, have, oh, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. And I, I guess I should mention too, for our school, we kind of feel Raku tea bowls, the black ones, the red ones, or even kind of the um, brown or candy colored ones. Those are like the typical bowls for koi cha. If you're gonna use something else for koi cha, you would actually use another cloth and set that down to be like an insulating factor when you drink a bowl from it. So like Raku wares are the highest or the most appropriate. If you use something else, you kind of have to like bump it up a little bit with this, I have one right here. It should be in my kimono, but it wasn't. There we go. So we might have a small cloth like this, and that when we are drinking tea with something that's not raku, we would have it on top of the bowl like that to help insulate our hands, and then also kind of give it a more regal air. So but it, there's kind of a rule of thumb to it. You know, usually what happens is you'll bring it to your teacher, like, how about this? No. Oh, okay. How about this? Mm, no. And then, you know, so it's kind of like there's not an exact law to it. It's just a feeling. But in general, koi cha, dark, somber, handmade, the, the hand of the artist, the hand of the kiln, but in a very natural way, usu cha bowls tend to be far more decorative. And it's nice to have the contrast. Right. Thank you. Uh, that question brings us to a couple of related ones from my colleague here at Alfred, Ben Howard. Ben, did, did you want to ask your question directly? I don't know if yes, I could. That'd be great. Uh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> thank Thanks you very much. Here. I appreciate it. Um, Zen practice is sometimes viewed as a solitary activity, but it's mm. actually profound. I lost you. I think, oh, of, you I, I think of wisdom and compassion. Mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, <clears throat> as part of the Mahayana tradition, and yes, that always yes. involves other people. I just want, would this be a fair description of, of Chado as well? Hmm. Yes, yes. I, it seems like, I'm trying to think of different examples in my head, but it seems like, yes, Chado is one of those arts or practices that you really need other people. You know, it's not just about you by yourself, but you and the interaction you have with others. Um, and even if by chance you don't have too many people around, it's still about you and these objects, um, you and the seasons. And so it really is about bringing out 
yourself and not just being by yourself, but being with others. And by nature, that also counts as others. Um, even the tea utensils themselves, the way we handled it, it's almost as if we, it's almost as if these are people too. You know, you handle it not as an object, but it has its own personality. And we're very careful with each thing. And the amount of respect we give things is almost as if a person is around um, for each object. And I know I'm slightly off topic, but even the scroll here, I mentioned that that's typically the only object we bow to in a tea room because we feel like the essence of the person who wrote it is right there. They put themselves into the object. So we're not necessarily bowing to the scroll, we're bowing to the person. Um, and so, yes, I, I think just like with um, Zen meditation, um, that can be solitary, but I think when you really get down to it, it's about your connections to others, or at least breaking down the barriers between what you think you are and what other people are. And so it all just kind of becomes one thing. Um, for, for me, doing tea made that really easier to see, but I know people do it in martial arts too. You know, that your body moving, that person's body moving, and you kind of connect with each other in a very physical and deep way. Um, for me, it makes more sense with tea, but I, I've seen so many other people do it in so many other ways. Um, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, of course. Thank you very much. Hi, hi. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Howard had another question about the temperature of oh, the hot sure. water for tea. And that relates to a question from Michael Shimbashi. Would you sip the tea quietly or would it be more like eating ramen or udon? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of a little bit of both. Um, with the thick tea and the thin tea, what happens is as you're drinking, right, there might be a little froth in the bowl. And at the very end, you wanna get that last bit of foam or froth or thick tea. And instead of just silently Drinking, the first few steps, sips, maybe yes. You get in, you get in, you get in, and then the last one, you kind of get the last bit. It's, it does a couple of things. One, it shows your appreciation, but you're really enthusiastic about the tea and you, you really want to get that last bit. But it's also very practical, be practical because there's all sorts of things happening in a tea room. And by making that sound, then the host knows you're finished. And so they're in the same room with you, but there's kind of different clues or cues we give to each other to know, oh, okay, now this, now you can ask me this question, now this is gonna happen. And so if you're too timid and too quiet, then it kind of throws the timing off. So it's nice, like, again, I mentioned koicha where we all share the bowl of koicha. It would get passed down from each guest and actually gets passed hand to hand. It's the only thing we pass from hand to hand. Everything else we have to put down first so it doesn't get broken. But the thick tea bowl, while you're drinking, will get passed hand to hand to each guest. And after they finish, well, the last guest will finish. And so there might be conversation going on. There's all these things happening. The host is turned a little bit towards the guests and they're talking, but they're also listening for that last. Then they can move on to something else. And then the first guest says, oh, can we please take a closer look at the bowl? Because none of us got to look at it because we were drinking. So the bowl needs to come back. And then maybe the host needs to turn around and replenish water to the kettle and other things. So there's, there's like a time to be quiet and there's a time to be loud. And that's why the first guess is important because they know when to bring them both up. It would be kind of weird if like someone's drinking like, oh, oh my God, oh, that's so good. You know, that would kind of be a little weird. Although you might feel it inside. <laughs> Speaking, kind of, speaking of that, a question from Chris Longwell. What about the taste of the tea and its relation to the process? Hmm. Well, it's all delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, that we don't add anything to the tea itself. It's really what the tea factory, not factory, the tea plantation, what they blend together. So they might take a little tea from this part, a little tea from that part, and they blend together to get a certain specific taste. And typically the teas then will have a name, you know, so even though it comes from a certain company, they'll have a name for this blend and a name for that blend. And they purposely make the koi cha stronger than the usu cha and different things like that. So, but I have found that what you eat before you have the tea actually will enhance or change the taste of the tea itself. Typically, we always have a sweet before we enjoy the tea. 
For usucha, we have the sweet like just before we have the tea. For koicha, there might be a lag of like 20, 30 minutes. So lighter sweets for usucha, heavier sweets for koicha. And that little bit of sweetness remains in your mouth. And then when you drink the tea, that tends to um, enhance the flavor. You're not trying to mask the bitterness, but somehow it changes. So if you have matcha yourself and you're having it at home, try it plain, you know, like don't eat anything before and then try a sweet before and then taste it and you'll get a different sensation. So you can kind of tweak it a little bit. I personally feel the same thing with sake. You know, there's been times I've gone out and had a great meal with friends and the company's wonderful and the food's good and I'm drinking it's like, oh, this is the best sake ever. And I figure out the name, I buy it, I go home, I turn on the TV, I'm sitting down like, oh, this, this is gonna be good. And I drink it, it's like, oh, it's not that special after all. So I think the taste really comes from the moment. It's not just physically what's in your mouth, but it's your attitude, the atmosphere, the other things you had before. And I think that really comes across in the tea gathering. So we don't just give you a bowl of tea, we create this whole atmosphere. And then it's, well, it almost can't help but to be delicious because mm -hmm. of everything you do beforehand. And there might be different tastes. And, you know, we, we try not to have the water too hot. It shouldn't be boiling. It's under a boil because boiling water is too hot for matcha. Um, you'll ruin the flavor, you know, and mask the subtleties and burn your mouth. And that's never fun, you know. Um, but really the moment is made through your actions and the friends you have there. And if you have good friends and good atmosphere and delicious food, everything you eat will taste good. But <laughs> if your friends are yeah, and, and you're uncomfortable and you just wanna get off your knees and you don't like wearing kimono, nothing's gonna taste good. So it's up to the host to make this moment the best as possible. So sometimes we don't need kimonos. Sometimes let's sit in tables and chairs. Sometimes let's eat outside or have tea outside. And sometimes let's make it really special. So you figure out what's the best way to enjoy this tea with these people. So it's not a ritual that doesn't ever change. And we all just have to be like super stern, superly super stern. There's literally hundreds of actual ways to make tea. And we learn them one at a time. And then you figure out which one's most appropriate for this moment. Um, sometimes it works great and sometimes it doesn't. But you, the effort makes it all kind of worthwhile. So even if you don't like the taste, somehow it doesn't matter because everything's delicious with friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Bill Geis and I tell each other when we're preparing for, <laughs> for online <laughs> Zoom events. It's, it's okay if it doesn't turn out perfect. It's, it's <laughs> but as a host, of course, you try your best. You know, I try my best. Of you course. try your best. But whatever <laughs> comes together, comes together. And we appreciate that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We have about five minutes left. Sure, this, sure. This session has been so wonderful. And uh, <laughs> here we are. Oh, no, it's four minutes. Okay. Ah, uh, well, I, I wanted to ask you a question that relates to one that Maxim Stark, who I believe is joining us from Poland, oh, asks, uh, he, he, he writes, Sensei, would you say a few words about the position of Japanese ceramics versus mm. Chinese origin utensils? in oh. today's Chano Yu. So sure. uh, Japanese sure. versus Chinese ceramics. And that related to a question I was wanting to pose. Since you began studying Chano Yu in 1992, how has tea practice changed? Wow. Well, um, I'll answer the first one and hopefully I can get to the second one too. Um, as I mentioned before, we talk about wabi a lot in tea, you know, wabi tea, um, wabi ceramics, you know, this very Japanese rustic feel is super important to us. But by no means is it the only way we enjoy ceramics or other things too. There's usually a mix of very natural and earthy things with sometimes these super beautiful, precise things. And throughout all of history, sorry, my dog's drinking water, <laughs> but throughout history, um, Chinese wares have been super revered so revered that the handling of a very famous Chinese object will be special and unique from compared to a Japanese object. Um, these very special things we call karamono. 
karamono are like revered Chinese wares, sometimes going back to the Tang Dynasty. There could be karamono tea bowls, which would be timoku chawans, of various types of timoku chawans. They're so special that you wouldn't put those on the floor. You have to put those on a stand first. So they have their own stand and the tea bowls on the stand. And there would be a complete, it would completely change the way you would make tea. The way you would fold the fukusa would be different. The way you would handle the bowls different because these are super revered. At one point, people thought, and this is like back at Hideyoshi's time or like in the 16th century, some people felt like unless you had a karamono object, you could not be considered a tea person. It was that important. So even to this day, um, those things are still super revered. And I think as it's so revered that some of those objects are better preserved in Japan than they have been in China. Because China maybe, you know, tastes have changed back and forth, but when, when Japanese culture really likes something, they like it forever. And so these things are in museums and such. But that's the interesting thing too, is that these things that would be in museums, like everything you have in your exhibition right now, these are the objects people would make tea with. You know, so it's not something that goes on a shelf, it's something that will be in your hand. And at a time, there were no museums. And so the only way you can see this wonderful, beautiful bowl from China, or this super special thing from Korea, or this recent thing made by someone else, is to be invited to a tea gathering by the person who owns it. So it's really special. Imagine like no one ever saw the Mona Lisa, and the only way you can see it, come to my house. You know, so you have to know the right people. There has to be connections. The only substitute is like this bowl and this bowl. They're called um, utsushi. And I always feel like I say that wrong. It's a copy, but it's like a replica. So this is a replica of a tea, of a tea bowl made by Chojiro, which is the first uh, grandmaster or first artisan of the Raku family, the Raku school. So Raku is not just a type of ceramic. It's a name of a family in Japan. So it's not really Raku ware unless it's made by the Raku family, but this is a copy. So I can't own the original, but I can have a very beautiful and detailed replica of it and use that. And that's respected. And this one also is a replica of this first type of very decorative Kyoto ware. And I just forgot the name of the person who it should be, but it'll come back to me later. Um, so these ideas having replicas are very common. Um, and so like many of those special Chinese things that we were talking about before, it might be impossible for me to ever use it, but I could get a very nice replica, very nice replica and use that in many ways too. Um, and then you were saying about the change in the tea world. Yes, we're, we're, we're at time now. So, so maybe okay. we can wrap up yeah, um, I probably could this, answer this, that one anyway. this, this chuck eye of 80 people uh, quickly here. And, and if, if you're willing to stay on a couple more minutes of people, want to ask questions yeah. after we yeah, officially that. close out the event uh, we'd be very grateful but yeah i'm wondering how has tea practice uh, changed since you began study in 1992 and there are probably people in this audience who would love to know how does one enter the study of tea sure um well i will if someone has to leave now thank you thank you very much for coming and joining us um i'm going to talk a little bit more and you're welcome to stay, but hey, life is busy and you've got other things to do. But again, thank you so much for staying with us tonight. Um, but to answer your question, um, there are people studying tea all around the world, particularly in any major city. With a little looking, you can find someone studying tea, particularly of the Urusenke school, because they actively try so much to spread tea outside the world. I'm um, sorry, outside of Japan. Um, the grandmaster, the 15th grandmaster, his father, the 14th, and then even the current master, they really want to spread Japanese culture and have peacefulness through a bowl of tea has been their big model. Um, myself personally, I started studying when I was a student at the U of I in Champaign. Um, there's a program there in a place called Japan House, and they have a beautiful, beautiful, authentic Japanese um, home with several tea rooms, and you can take a university class in that and learn about tea, and then afterwards you can keep studying. But of course, we're not all there. So um, there's websites you can check and there's people studying all over the world. Um, just find someone and start taking lessons. Um, and again, I, I know I've said it many, many times, but I'm up at Urusenke School. There's like a dozen other schools and we all have slightly different ways of doing things and slightly different philosophies. The Urusenke School 
uh, decided, not decidedly, uh, was founded by someone of the merchant class, Sindo Rikyu, very famous, very much considered the father of modern tea. And, but he was of the merchant class. And so there are some schools of tea that were founded by people of the samurai class. So they decided to do things very differently. They're very bold compared to the merchant style. They're very um, distinctive of certain social classes. So they might separate people in different ways. Um, it's super interesting, but whatever person you can find will be great. You know, so just start um, and see how it goes. Thank you so much. You've inspired us. And uh, <laughs> most everybody has stayed after a few more minutes to hear your words. We are so grateful, uh, Francis Sensei, for joining us in this virtual setting of a chakai of about 80 participants from Ooh. across <laughs> North America and Europe. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to all the artists out there too, because it's the utensils that make tea alive. You know, we couldn't do it without tea bowls and tea scoops and tea whisk. And, and it works for both of us. You put your heart into it and then we appreciate it so much. And so you make these things and they really live and they have like importance to us as we make tea in a way that it's hard to see in other ways, you know, like the love that we have for utensils just goes beyond so many other things. So like, we love it when you make your things and you share it with us, it just makes our life so much better. So thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you. This event has made our, our, our lives better. And thank you everybody for attending. It's good to see you all. And we hope if you haven't seen it already, you uh, come to the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum to view Path of the T-Bowl. Good night, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, be well, take care. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank for having you. me. This was amazing.